Anyway, let's go. Retains a psychological emphasis that is imperative to how its inner systems operate. The hierarchical command creates a centralized authority that encompasses a vast amount of behavioral science and refinement. The armed forces systematically develops its officers to make dispassionate and strategically calculated decisions that in times of war will often have a dramatic impact on both the service personnel serving under their command and for the civilian population inhabiting the area of conflict. The yeah, the civilian population love when armed personnel come into their fucking towns, dude. The importance of conformity and obedience is relentlessly ingrained into volunteers throughout indoctrination and essentially forges a mindset that ensures the fast and accurate transmission of orders and communications. There is no room for error nor hesitation in the field of military operations, and total respect and acquiescence to any superior is essential. This is the reason enlisted personnel are commonly addressed by surnames or nicknames, whereas officers are recognized by rank, and the higher an officer climbs in the command structure, the greater the importance of these hierarchical monikers become. David Russell Williams enrolled in the Royal Canadian Air Force in 1987 and was soon promoted to captain by January 1st. I forget that Canada has a, a military all the time. Like, it's always so funny to me when I'm reminded that, like, there is a Canadian military. Anyways, From that moment on, he would have been addressed as Sir by his subordinates and Captain Williams by his superiors. Described as an elite pilot and shining bright star of the military, he quickly rose through the ranks and was promoted to Colonel in June of 2004, while also being appointed the role of Commanding Officer at CFB Trenton, Canada's largest Air Force base. He was essentially in full command of over 7,000 military personnel, all of whom would have then referred to him as Colonel or Colonel Williams, without exception. This would have afforded him an extensive amount of psychosocial equanimity and confidence, and wasn't exclusive to his work life. His that is an expensive ass word, dude. This one's a bold one. My man said equanimity. Psychosocial equanimity. God damn, dude title of colonel would have been printed on all forms of identification and every formal encounter would sanctify this military standing. A doctor, lawyer, police officer, or any other figure of authority would recognize and comply to the traditional courtesy of addressing him by his professional rank, boosting his composure and self-assurance each and every time as his elevated social standing and military achievements were accentuated for all to see. There was one exception, however, and that was the day he met Detective Sergeant Jim Smith. Before so, clarifying, I hear this detective is cracked, so I'm excited. psychological relevance as to why a senior detective would purposefully refrain from addressing a highly respected military commander by his formal title. First, consolidate each of the elements and circumstances that led to the crossing- Damn, bro, he's lit- he's already- he's already fucking coming in with the- he's already coming in hot by, uh, naming- uh, by- by using his government name and not sir. It's kind of wild. Is it like that? Is- is that- is that how it is in Canada? Because, like, I feel like in America, we don't venerate our, our vets like that much. You know what I mean? Like, it's all fake. Yes, we do. No, people just say, like, thank you for your service. But, I mean, people don't really care. Like, I, I think people fake care. You know what I mean? If you're an active commander, the biggest Air Force uh, base dog, we do, but it's completely service level. We do for the higher ranks. ...of paths between these two profoundly dissimilar, yet equally fascinating individuals. Ten days earlier, on January 28th of 2010, Andy Lloyd received a call from his mother around midday, stating that his younger sister, 27-year-old Jessica Lloyd, had failed to show up to work and wasn't responding to phone calls or text messages. He immediately drove to her isolated home on Ontario's Highway 37 and discovered she wasn't there. There was no sign of a break-in, yet Jessica was known for... Like I'll tell you, a country that absolutely does not give a shit that someone's like a veteran, Turkey, everyone's a veteran. Like, you don't even think about it. Because everyone fucking serves. So, like, no one gives a shit. It's not, like, special. You know what I mean? 
Like, what are you going to do? Someone's going to be like, oh, excuse me, sir. I'm a veteran. Please uh, respect me. And then the other guy will be like, yeah, so am I, idiot. Leaving her doors unlocked, and all of her personal items were still inside the premises, including her phone, passport, and driver's license. Ottawa is known for its remarkably low crime rate and widely recognized as the but safest I guess they're city high in ranking, Canada. So it's the different. local authorities had resources to spare, and a missing persons investigation was launched immediately, which included an entire division from the Ottawa Police Force, over 2,000 members of the public, and even a specialist search and rescue unit from the Canadian Air Force. The word spread extremely fast across the city through damn the bro that's sus as fuck he would it what did they use his own air force that he was a part of in the base to find the fucking person help of the media and on the second day of jessica's disappearance an anonymous member of the public came forward with vital information he stated that while driving home from work the night before at roughly 3 a.m he drove past jessica's house and noticed an suv parked in a field just a short distance away he stated that he remembered feeling that something just seemed off as it was parked in such an unusual area at such a late hour and he had drove past the premises thousands of times before and not once seen the vehicle before for that moment. Police immediately canvassed the area in question where they found tire tracks in the field and boot prints leading up to Jessica's house. They had attained their first two significant pieces of evidence, which then became the foundation for the next stages of the investigation. Police immediately set up six roadblocks throughout the surrounding area and stopped every SUV that passed in the hope of finding a match to the tire tracks. They reportedly stopped over 200 vehicles over the next four days, yet had no luck, and were on the verge of reassigning their manpower from the roads to conduct foot patrols in off-road areas and pathways. However, at roughly 7.30 p.m. on February 4th, their luck did a full 180, as the sports utility vehicle of Colonel Russell Williams was stopped. He was reportedly polite and nonchalant about what he thought was a routine traffic procedure and was sent on his way after just 90 seconds. Unbeknownst to him, he was immediately placed under police surveillance from that moment on, as his tires came up as a complete match to the tracks found in the field near Jessica Lloyd's house. House. Two days later, on Sunday, February the 7th, he received a call from police headquarters in Ottawa asking him to visit the premises for the purpose of answering questions in relation to an ongoing investigative matter. The colonel didn't inquire further and agreed to drop into the police station immediately. He reportedly told his wife that he would be back for dinner before setting off and arrived at the headquarters shortly before 3 p.m., where he was greeted by Detective Sergeant Jim Smith, a trained polygraph technician. That's a fake name, dude. My man's name is Jim Smith. Can't trust him. Don't care. Don't care if he's very capable, okay? That's Jim Smith, really? Two first names? Can't trust him. Jail. Bad vibes. Fucked. Vibes? Fucked. And, and see hey, what's going on? I'm Jim Smith. I'm Jonathan Henry. Nope. Not happening. Your investigator of the policing. I guess Smith is not really a first name. Is Smith not a first name? It's is Smith not a first name? No? Okay, fuck that one up. It still sounds fake though. Who the fuck is named Smith? I went to high school with a Smith. It's like a common most common last name. I guess it's yeah. It's the most common last name. Like the famous Smith Will. <laughs> Behavioral Sciences Unit. Right. You just have to see the girls. I'm just going to move your gloves here. That's a little microphone, just okay. to make sure there's nice and clear. Um, as you can see here, everything in this room is uh, videotaped and audio taped. You ever been interviewed by the police in a, in a room like this before? I or? have never been interviewed like this. Oh, no? Okay. What is going on at this point, dude? What are you like appropriating a, a like a Japanese haircut or something? What the fuck is this, dude? Motherfucker literally looks like he's from the Edo era. What the fuck? Straight up put a bowl in the front. I mean, what is happening, dude? It's like a little square patch in the front. What is he got a QR code, dude? You walk up with a phone. Boop. 
Scan that shit. Takes you to a website. Just go bald at that point. Yeah, like literally, this is so crazy. Oh, yeah. There are three types of security clearance for all military institutions serving under NATO. Confidential, secret, and the highest being top secret, which is what the colonel just specified. This takes roughly eight months to be cleared for, and only a very select few are given this level of jurisdiction, as unauthorized disclosure of top secret information could cause exceptionally grave damage to national security. It took just over 40 seconds for the colonel to remind the detective of who he was, and just how important he was. It's a testament to his self-conceited air of invincibility and just how assured he felt in the present situation. All right. Well, again, Russell, I appreciate you coming in. Uh... The gas canade is casually acknowledged, yet quickly brushed to one side by the detective, followed by the informal address to the subject using his yeah, first top name. Secret. He Fuck immediately off. sets like, the stage for the shit. interview and takes the colonel down from his elevated platform for the sole purpose of stripping away confidence. This increases the telling signs in body language and intonation when information is fabricated and also decreases cognitive stamina, lessening the amount of time an individual can keep a facade before they essentially break. Placing the subject on an even platform also allows for the investigator to both exercise and mystify his own powers, which will serve a significant purpose during the later stages of the interrogation. This is all done in a manner that demoralizes the subject, while at the same time maintains an appropriate level of rapport, and gives reason for the detective's non-confrontational disposition. An investigation like this, I mean, I'm sure you can appreciate it's been big news, uh, especially yeah. down uh, Belleville way. Um, and, you know, obviously our approach to cases like this is that uh, uh, we don't give up on somebody being alive until mm -hmm. we get evidence that they're not. So um, because of that, we're treating uh, Jessica's case uh, as an emergent situation, Absolutely. obviously. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're fast forwarding things that we might normally take our time with. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why uh, we're here on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, sure. So uh, again, I appreciate it. No um, we're going to do a pretty thorough interview today. Okay. okay? Um, and the reason for that is because Canadians are so funny. Like they're so they're starving for like Canadian centric content that like immediately they're like, Oh my God. Oh, don't you know? I live right there. I, I live right there to the murder. That's crazy. But there's like fucking five people that live in Canada, bro. Of course, you know, every fucking murder that happened. Ottawa gang, rise up! Because uh, the last thing we want is to be calling people back again and again and again, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go over a number of things, and uh, I'm going to explain what all those are to you, okay? okay? Um, I'm a big coffee guy. I don't know if you're a, a coffee Canadians love being like, I live right there! Right there is like five hours away by drive, but because there's like 11 Canadians that are alive, it's still technically right there. Oh, yeah. I remember when this murder happened right down the street, don't you know? Where did it happen? Five hours away? You know? A day's drive. That's pretty close. I didn't want to drink in front of you, so... No, I appreciate um, that. All right, go ahead. I could uh, definitely... Are they black? Yeah, they're just black with, uh, with sugar. All right, and again, um, like I said, this interview is going to be very thorough. Mm -hmm. um, but again... Uh, I have a simple rule when I talk to people. It's uh, I'm sure you're the same way. I, I treat pe everybody with respect. I don't know why I ask if they do the same for me. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to start off by uh, going through um, what your rights are, okay? okay? Just like everybody else, okay? okay. Um, have you ever read your rights before? No. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you've seen it on TV a whole bunch of times, right. but that's usually the American version. So okay. I'll go over with you briefly, okay? Uh -huh. Russell, just to avoid any confusion, because people do get confused. Dude. And then Canada has the audacity to act like they're a separate nation, dude. Confused when they're talked to by the police. The American version. Uh, um, you're obviously not under I got to pee today. so bad. Okay. Holy anytime you feel uh, you want to leave here, you feel free to do so. The door's not locked. Teresa will walk you down the lobby anytime you want, okay? Mm -hmm. Although the subject was free to leave at any time, there was a very subtle yet highly effective subconscious strategy set in place to try to stop this from happening. The detective has sat between Russell and the door. You will see this method utilized in almost every interrogation, as it's a subliminal message essentially telling the subject, if you want out of this room, you have to go through me. It's been argued that this can act as an 
an imperative emotional barrier that has often prevented many suspects from leaving these areas of which they are most vulnerable and susceptible to incrimination. Um, if there's anything that comes up in our interview today, Russell, that, uh, that you feel you want to talk uh, to a lawyer about, sure. um, you, just, uh, you just let me know, okay? Sure. And the reason for that is I want to explain to you exactly what's going on here, okay? Um, uh, Jessica uh, Lloyd is, um, is one of uh, four cases that we're currently investigating, okay? Right. Um, and essentially what's happened is over the past uh, uh, about four or five months, um, there have been four occurrences, that, like I said, that we're looking into. Mm. Uh, two of those occurrences occurred in September of 2009. Yeah. Um, and very briefly, they were up in the, uh, the Tweed area. Yeah. Uh, they involved uh, somebody entering uh, two different women's houses mm -hmm. um, in the evening hours and uh, committing uh, sexual acts. Yeah. Okay. During 2009, there were 34 break-ins and attempted break-ins in the quiet town of Orleans, Ottawa, resulting in the theft of hundreds of intimate female garments, one incident of rape, and one incident of forcible confinement. All of these occurrences took place not far from the home of Russell Williams, who is now the prime suspect for each of these infractions at the time of his interrogation. Uh, in uh, November of 2009, yeah. uh, a young lady by the name of uh, Marie-France uh, Como. Um, um, yeah. yeah was found uh, murdered in her home in Brighton. Yeah. And uh, we believe that there was a sexual uh, component to that crime as well. Okay. Corporal Marie France Como was a 37-year-old military traffic technician based at CFB Trenton. She was raped and suffocated to death inside her home in late November of 2009, which the colonel was also the prime suspect for at this moment. And um, then most recently we have Jessica Lloyd's disappearance, mm -hmm. okay? So essentially, when you look at those kind of crimes, we're looking at a number of different uh, potential criminal charges, all right? Um, we're looking at issues uh, all the way from the most serious one, which is first degree murder, mm -hmm. uh, kidnapping, uh, sexual assault, mm -hmm. uh, break and enter with intent to commit sexual assault, yeah. um, forcible confinement, okay? And uh, so what I want to make sure you understand, and this is what we've been doing with everybody we've been talking to, is that Clearly, when we find out who's responsible for one or all of those crimes, yeah. uh, they could be charged with one or all of those offenses, okay? Whether it's you or whether it's anybody else, all right? The best comment I've seen thus far on the hairstyle is someone said, that dude's got a Hitler mustache on his head. That was very good. That's, I did not think about that. You won't be laughing at this when you're off your balding meds, brother? Yeah, that's why I'm not going to get off of them. And that's why it's important that we uh, make sure that people understand what they have to do and what they don't have to do when they're talking to us, mm. okay? So as I said before, any point today uh, you feel the need, you want to speak to a lawyer, uh, you let me know, and okay. uh, we can take you to a room where you can do that in private, okay? Um, is there any reason you want to call a lawyer now? No. Okay. These first two attacks uh, happened uh, not that far from my place in Holy shit, brother. Did not realize that the entire nation state of Canada was watching right now. Crazy. I take it back. Tim Hortons, don't you know? Very good coffee. The second one did. Thank you, Souvereniste, for the 50 tier one gift subs. Reasonably close as well, but the second one was, uh, was very close. Yeah. So certainly at the time, the OPP did a, uh, a door to door. Yeah. Uh, Dude, why is he so fucking low? Dude? This one's called the whisper technique, where if you make sure the detective can't hear you, you win. The analysis of vocal intonation is a tricky thing when dealing with interrogations, oh my as God. it cannot be used as evidence in court. Yet intuition would give many the sense that discomposure is emanating from- I was just kidding. I didn't realize that was actually what he was doing, kind of. The colonel at this moment. The way he is speaking comes across as slightly nervous and unsure. He would appear to most as being agitated in the manner he is both processing information and communicating his responses. This type of cognitive recognition is a difficult thing to articulate into words, and in Investigators simply characterize it as gut instinct, which Detective Jim Smith would have no doubt been feeling at this moment. He would have been almost certain that the man sitting before him was guilty, simply by the way he was talking, quiet with a hint of nervousness, incongruent with how a military commander would normally carry himself. Okay. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm aware of that from uh, looking at the different cases. 
And essentially, uh, Russell, uh, in a nutshell, that's what we wanted to, uh, to talk to you about, okay? Um, those four cases are of uh, concern to us. And, um, you know, you've kind of uh, almost hit the nail on the head about uh, some of our issues that kind of uh, make us want to talk to, to Russell Williams, okay? Because mm -hmm. um, essentially, uh, there was a, a, a connection um, between you and, uh, and all four of those cases. Would you agree? Geographically, and then I guess or I drive past. Uh, yes, I, I would yes. have to say there is a, a connection. Yeah. The colonel is asked to state his movements and activity over the past four days, which is known in forensic psychology as gathering pretext. The detective wants to get an initial. Bro, that gum chewing is like automatically sussy as fuck. He's. He, it's not like he's. Ch he's chewing the gum, like he's. You know, like he's ready to do a murder on Jim Smith. Alibi I mean, I chew gum all the time. You never see me go. If I, if you see me chewing gum like that, like, you know. The suspect before the confrontational phase of the interrogation begins. This is the most calm a state that he intends to keep Russell in before he ramps up the pressure. And a more relaxed suspect often results in more detailed pretext. Thus, more information to scrutinize and correlate with any changes made at a later stage. Friday on the day, I was, um... Friday on the day I was at home most of the time. Most of the day I had a sort of a stomach flu. Okay. In Ottawa or Tweed? In Tweed. In Tweed? Tweed is a village in Ontario where the colonel had a second vacation. Literally a fake place, dude. I just, you cannot convince me Canada is a real country. Motherfuckers got a place called Tweed, dude. Come on. Really? Really, Canada? You're going to fucking act like this is a real country? And then have places called Tweed? Okay. Station home located roughly 125 miles from his house in Ottawa. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so we backtrack then. So all day Friday, you're at home. Yeah. And then w what time do you leave to go to the base to sleep there on the Friday night? Um, I'm not sure. Probably just, you know, went in for just before bed. Uh, so I probably left tweeted between eight and nine or so. Dude, I hate this, dude. He's so low. Speak up, motherfucker. Why is he talking like this? Okay. Um, and you get to the base and spend the evening there and get up for the 5.30? Yeah. Okay. That's right. So we backtrack from there. Um, you. When did you arrive at your home uh, at the cottage? Can, I want to get confused between your home in Ottawa and the home yeah, in Tweed. So, uh, no, I had been in Tweed all week. Yeah. Uh, the week prior now. Um, yeah, I think that's the case. I was in Tweed all week. Flew Saturday. Headed to Ottawa Saturday night. Okay. So, um, if you didn't have the stomach flu on the Friday, what was your schedule that day? Eight, really. Okay. Um, what would have been my schedule? Just a standard schedule in the office. Okay. So, uh, office brief in the morning, a couple, uh, couple of meetings. I can't remember what the specifics uh, were going to be. Okay, so... Or he's so quiet, even the subtitles didn't pick him up. Um, Thursday night, you slept at Tweed? Or you... Yep. All right. And what... Would you marry a Canadian? 100% yes. Are you kidding me? Canadian women are the best, dude. Did you Thursday during the day? Thursday during the day, I was at the base again. Um, I think it was a fairly standard day. I can't recall exactly, but uh, yeah, nothing. I was not flying, so I was at the base. So I would have gone in early in the morning, back in the evening again. Okay. The method of gathering pretext is then focused on the murder of Marie France Como. Okay. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to walk you through November, but I'm going to take you to a date that's probably pretty fresh in your mind, uh, uh, the day that, uh, that Marie France uh, Como. Yeah. Um, do you remember how you found out? I uh, do. Yeah, I was sent an email. Um, found out. Well, as soon as the, uh, the off staff and the base learned, they told me. Okay. So I got an email. I can't remember if it was late at night, early in the morning. It was certainly I saw it. Uh, 
I want to say first thing in the morning because I had just come back from Ottawa. I was in Ottawa for um, um, a set of meetings on one of the days. I can't remember what, what day of the week we're talking about, but uh, yeah, no, I mean, obviously when your people get skilled, it uh, gets your attention. So. Absolutely. Yeah, I very much remember that. These guys about to be like, I could not have done the murder. I'm too quiet as a person. It's called the whisper technique. Also known as whisper of a dream. I could not have done the murder. I have, look at my hairstyle. Does this, does this resemble the hairstyle of a murderer? I think not. And how did you know Marie Franz Coleman? I'd only met her once. Um, she was on a crew uh, I was on uh, just after I got to the base. Okay. Do you know uh, roughly when that happened? That we were on the same crew? The time you met her, the one time there, yeah. It was soon after I got to the base, so uh, I, I don't remember exactly, but I would say in the first couple of months, so August, September. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, you got that email yeah. notifying you that something had happened. Yeah. Uh, do you have uh, any kind of a, a clear recollection as to how your schedule was going that week? Well, I can't remember what, again, what day that uh, the message came in. Just a second. Um, no, I can't remember what day, day of the week, but I, um, I just think there was a whole bunch of activity uh, spun up as a result, obviously. No, I can't remember the day of the week. Um, this was the third time in quick succession the colonel stated that he couldn't remember the answer to the question. A normal interaction between two parties would most often elicit the person posing the question to reassure the individual it was directed at. Statements along the lines of, don't worry if you can't remember, we'll move on, or it was a long time ago, it must be difficult to recollect, would be afforded as a form of consolation and to also break the uncomfortable silence. Even during a legitimate witness statement, some form of emotional assistance or encouragement will often be given, especially to Leet. someone in the midst of recollecting a distressing moment or time period from the past. On this occasion, there is no such reassurance from the detective whatsoever, only a stoic gaze and not a single shift in body posture during the moments of silence. I'm just trying to think through the news report. Okay, dude, fuck you, Chad. Actually, fuck you, okay? Actually, fuck you. Do you understand? Like, literally fuck yourself, okay? Like, it, so what's up? Every time I just, like, wait for the top of the fucking hour, it's like, you know, it, it, it's just, if I wait for near the top of the hour, you're just gonna always fucking tomato me ahead of time? Yeah, it's top of the fucking hour, dude. Yeah. There you go. It's time for a 60-second ad break. I'm gonna run the ad now. If you no longer want to see the ads, you can subscribe. You subscribe for $5 or you can subscribe for free with a Twitch Prime. God fucking damn it, dude. Oh, we won. Oh, look at me. I'm Chad. We won. Okay, there you go. Yeah, you fucking caught me, dude. Okay, you caught me before I hit the ad break. Now I'm just going to be sporadic and, and random and it's going to fuck you up even further. How about that? How about fucking that? Here's the ad break now. Yeah, I remember a time when it used to be Dankies, dude. And now it's tomato time. It's always tomato town now whenever I... Whenever I run ads. Yeah. Reports I read. No, I, I'm sorry. I can't remember what day that was, but... Uh... What I what we learned after the fact was that the um, the MPs had learnt uh, of her death. I think quite a bit after her body had been discovered. Okay. So I think what happened. No, I'm sorry. Just a second. So if we were to uh, to you know do a, a similar uh, investigation in your background, is there is there anything you can think of that anybody may have misinterpreted or anything uh, in your history that somebody might say Russell Williams? Uh, 
Absolutely. Did this? No. Okay. Be very boring. What's that? It'll be very boring. <laughs> All right, because essentially that's what I'm looking at. Is it? Uh, yeah. No. No. It, it would not be. As a matter of fact, guess what? It was not very boring. Um, I th you seem like a very intelligent person, and I think you can see how um, a surprise like that would uh, certainly set off some alarm bells in our investigation, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, so the next thing we need to cover off is, uh, well, I'll just ask you this straight out. Uh, given the types of crimes we're investigating, uh, do you get much chance to uh, to watch television shows, CSI, things like that? I do watch, uh, I prefer Law & Order, but I do watch CSI occasionally, yes. Okay. So you have an idea of, obviously, the forensic capabilities, things like yeah. that are out there. What would you be willing to give me today to help me um, move past you in this investigation? What, uh, what do you need? Well, um, would you be willing to supply things like fingerprints, blood samples, sure. things like that? Yeah. Okay. Um, this is what is known in both psychology and philosophy as a crossroad. A moment in your life when a single and often huh? instantaneous decision you make will take you on one of two exceedingly diverging paths in your journey. The only two pieces of evidence that police had acquired at this point in time were the tire tracks and the footprints outside the missing person's residence. What many are unaware of is that the DNA found on Marie France Como was not admissible, as her body was highly decomposed at the time of discovery, thus making any genetic analysis virtually impossible, as this was before the era of the latest DNA testing method known as next generation sequencing. Only one of the sexual assault victims had male DNA found on the back of her neck, yet this was by far the least severe attack which falls into the bracket of forcible confinement and had no exterior elements connected to the more serious infractions of murder and rape. The evidence of the tire tracks would be easily refuted by a defense team as they were a relatively common brand for off-road vehicles which would extinguish the BRD standard of proof, also known as guilt beyond all reasonable doubt. The only significant piece of evidence were the footprints. It was the singular and emblematic element linked to the culpability of Jessica Lloyd's disappearance, and notice how the colonel looks down at his own boots as he gives his response to the following request. Footwear impressions? Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, I think that's what we're gonna, we're gonna ask you to do, okay. all right? I told you when I came in here uh, that I'm going to treat you with respect and I've asked you to do the same for me. Um, we talked about the whole idea of how we've uh, uh, approached you here, okay? Uh-oh. Uh, the, the trying to be as just free as possible, mm -hmm. okay? But the problem is, Russell, is every time I walk out of this room, there's another issue that comes up, okay? And it's not issues that point away from you. It's issues that point at you, okay? And I, wanna, I want you to see what I mean, mm -hmm. all right? This is the footwear impression of the person who approached the rear of Jessica Lloyd's house mm -hmm. on the evening of the 28th and 29th of January, yeah. okay? Because essentially when you're dealing with footwear impressions, um, we have a gentleman on the OPP who's uh, basically world-renowned. Uh, his name is John Norman. Mm -hmm. and Another fake name. Dude, I don't believe these guys. Canada, fake country. All the names are fake. Jim Smith, this is my friend John Norman. Essentially, with footwear impressions, uh, you're in a situation where you're, you're pretty much in the area of, uh, of fingerprints, mm -hmm. okay? All of the previous affirmations were fabricated for the sole purpose of heightening psychological pressure. Footprints are not even close to being as indistinguishable nor incriminating as fingerprints. And although footwear and tire track examiners exist and undergo extensive training, there were none on the premises at that time. And John Norman was in fact a regular police officer who simply printed out the images just two doors away from the interior. This is called the lying technique. It's very effective. Room. This is a photocopy of the boot that uh, you took off your foot yeah. just a little while ago, okay? Now, I'm not an expert in footwear impressions, so I rely on the experts. Footwear impressions are very much like... Don't uh, tell me this motherfucker's wearing the same shoe that he did the rape and murder in, dude. Are you fucking stupid? Like fingerprint comparisons, okay? You take a look at this print, and again, this is one print. This person walked 
through, there's several different prints to compare. Mm -hmm. So we're going to get features off of one print to compare, features off of another print to compare. Yep. These are identical. Okay. Your vehicle drove up the side of Jessica Lloyd's house. Your boots walked to the back of Jessica Lloyd's house on the evening of the 28th and 29th of January. Okay. You want discretion. We need to have some honesty, okay? Because this is this is getting out of control really fast, Russell. Okay, really, really fast. Hmm. I mean, that's crazy. One, more than one person can own the same shoe or have like a similar size. And even beyond that, a footwear impression if not corrupted by like weather or whatever, you could probably figure out what, uh, like wh how much that person weighs, all this other shit, right? Like I assume that a footwear, like a footprint could show a lot. It would, it would show how much you weigh. It would show like, if you have any sort of like, um, uh, what do you, if you have like uh, any sort of, uh, like walking problem or anything like that. But even then, no, no, and no. Wait, why not? Yeah, a foot. No, that can literally show your gait. It can show how much you weigh. It can show so many things. What the fuck are you talking about? It just entirely depends on the quality of the impression, though. Like, if, if you know, they got it, like, immediately after it happened, if the weather wasn't uh, terrible, you know what I mean? It would give you, it, depending on how many uh, impressions they have, how many footprints they have, they could show you, like, literally your leg length. No, nah, that's science fiction shit. No, it's not. But having said that, it's all entirely dependent on, you know, it's all entirely dependent on what the soil looked like, how weathered it was, and also, uh, lastly, that, like, there aren't other fucking uh, people that uh, are suspects with the same shoe size and same shoe, shit like that. So it, it can't be, it can't be all that. Like, I, I don't think you can, you know, I don't think you can use that to, like, 100% say, like, this is the person. It's not going to be the nail in the coffin? Yeah, that's what, no, I know. I know, I, I understand. You can this use it, you control. can use it to figure out if this person is this a suspect or not. This relates to the now, previously but. stated tactic of the interrogator exaggerating and mystifying his own powers while maintaining significant level of rapport with a suspect. He's essentially telling the colonel that he is still a friend, yet the powers that he has can only benefit him if he acknowledges the accusation, which at this moment isn't a full confession, only that he was present at the scene in question. The reason that he... Dude, I already fucking ran the ad, guys. Jesus Christ. I ran the ad an hour ago, man. I ran the fucking... I ran the ad an... Not an hour ago, sorry. Like, in the beginning of the hour. Chill. I need you guys to stop throwing tomatoes at me, dude. I'm, like, sad. Every time I say having said that, you throw tomatoes at me. Making me sad, dude. Detective asserts to the suspect's presence at the crime scene, while not directly accusing him of the actual crime, is for the purpose of affording him multiple options of how he chooses to respond. An outright accusation can often lock up a suspect and cause them to deny everything as a reflex response, and this often leads to them requesting legal counsel and stopping the interrogation dead in its tracks. Affording the suspect an exit strategy results in a higher chance of acknowledgement. As an example, the colonel could admit that he happened to be at the crime scene at the time in question, yet think up ulterior reasons as to why he was there. It wouldn't be a full confession, yet it would get the detective one foot in the door, and this primary admittance would then become the new platform for further building the case against the suspect. Research shows that once a person has complied with a small request, they are more likely to comply with a larger demand. Alright, I came in here a few hours ago, 
and I called you the way I called you today because I wanted to give you the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. But you and I both know you were at Jessica Lloyd's house, and I need to know why. What the fuck? Bro, the rest of that, the rest of that partition is falling off, dude. Literally in the process, we are watching his hair. And sliding down. Well, I don't know what to say. It's, um... Well, you need to explain it because this is the other problem we're having, Russell. Okay. Bro, how are you not going to be like, Motherfucker, am I the only person on the planet who has the same shoe? Like, not to give the fucking murderer rapist, like, any ideas here, because obviously, you know, what's done is done. But, like, how are you not going to say, like, what, you think, like, I'm the only one who owns this fucking pair of shoe in Canada? I know there's, like, 12 people in Canada, but, like, you know, that means 11 other people could potentially own this shoe. Chill. Again, these decisions are made by me. Mm -hmm. Right now, there's a search warrant being executed at your residence in Ottawa. So your wife now knows. No shot, that's real. He's lying about that too, right? What's going on? There's a search warrant being executed at the, your residence in Tweed, and your vehicle's been seized. Okay. You and I both know they're going to find evidence that links you to these situations. Okay. You and I both know that the unknown offender. Male. Male. God damn it, dude. What the fuck is up with this audio? On Marie France Como's body, it's going to be matched to you. Quite possibly before the evening's over. Okay? This is a major investigation. The Center of Forensic Science is on call 24 hours a day helping us with this. Mm -hmm. Your opportunity to take some control here and to have some explanation that anybody is going to believe is quickly expiring. Mm -hmm. The narrative technique is a variant of the reframing technique, which is when the interrogator reframes the risks associated with not cooperating, and also the gains associated with cooperating. In this particular instance, he's magnifying the beneficial elements of the suspect being able uh -huh. to tie his own narrative to the crimes, while also increasing the fear of him having that same opportunity taken away. Okay. Russell, hmm? listen to me for a second, okay? When that evidence comes in, when that DNA match, when that phone rings and somebody knocks on this door, mm -hmm. your credibility. Okay, is what? If this guy's a boss, someone is. He already told someone that, like, you know, to call him in, which will be fucking sick. If he like already told someone on the other side, like when he walked out before, like, call me in, you know, half an hour exactly or whatever. It's gone. Okay. Because this is how credibility works, all right? And I know you're an intelligent person, and you probably don't need to hear this explanation, but I also know your mind's racing right now, okay? Because I've sat across a lot of people in your position over the years, mm -hmm. okay? The bottom line is, is that as soon as we get that, that piece of evidence that solidifies it, mm -hmm. DNA, okay? As soon as the expert in footwear impressions, the expert in tire impressions, and says yes wow that's crazy that they have both an expert in tire impressions and footwear impressions i guess you know i've examined those and they're mm -hmm. a match mm -hmm. it's all over because as soon as that happens where's your credibility where's your believability russell you know there's only one option what do you what do you what other option is there What's the option? Well, I don't think you want the cold-blooded psychopath option. Dude, when he goes, what options are there? It's over. Like, look at this. Look at this cross-arm technique, dude. He's completely closed off. He knows he's fucked. He is so fucked. And he is so aware of it. Like, an innocent person in his situation would be like, dude, this is fucking ridiculous. Like, 
This is absolutely ridiculous. What's happening here is crazy. Like, I've never been here. Or, you know what I mean? Like, even if he had been there, like, he'd be like, this is, I'm innocent. He would be declaring his innocence over and over again. Not bargaining with the investigator. Like, oh, what options do I have? I might be wrong. Okay, because uh, don't get me wrong. I've met guys who actually kind of enjoyed the notoriety. Got off on it. Got off on having that label. Bernardo being one of them. I don't see that in you. If I saw that in you, I wouldn't be back in here talking to you, quite frankly. This is in essence the reframing technique that can also be interpreted as the ego up and fear up techniques combined. The detective is heightening the perceived benefit. Dude, stop, dude. Yo, this is so made up, dude. Oh my God, I'm sorry. Why is like criminal psychology so fucking pseudoscientific slash everything just fucking sounds like like some dude who was high as fuck made this up? Benefits of a suspect's character being presented in a better light while also increasing the fear of his character being further vilified. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you got me fooled. I don't know. This is over. And it can have a a bad ending where Jessica's parents continue to wonder where her daughter's lying. And I don't know. I mean, obviously, there's a huge search still underway, and it'll continue. It'll continue until her body's found. That might even happen tonight, for all I know. Oh. While sighs are often attributed to sadness and frustration, they have also been linked to the fight or flight response, as the additional accumulation of oxygen is essentially preparing you for battle or to safely run away. What happened to the gum, dog? It's over, dude. What did he fucking suck on that thing? He, he chewed on it so hard that the gum literally evaporated, dude. He's no longer chewing. The thought of a victim's body being found that same evening evoked a subconscious feeling of danger in the suspect, which most likely resulted in this anatomical reaction. Once that happens, then I don't know what other cards you would have to play. It's called the swallow technique. What are we going to do? Oh shit, he looks okay. so fucking guilty. Call a lawyer, like what are you doing at this point? I mean, I mean, fuck him, I'm glad he's in jail, but like, what the fuck? Like, how does he not know that he should be calling a lawyer? Like, what the fuck? Call me Russ. I'm gonna do Russ. What he should be doing here is the calling a lawyer technique. It's very effective. Okay? Very, very effective technique. Little used on videos like this one because a lot of these are high profile cases of people who did not get away. So, you know. None of them use the calling a lawyer technique. So, uh, you know, I highly recommend it. Jessica, somewhere we can find her easily. Like, is this something where I can make a call and tell somebody to go to a location and they're going to find her? Or is this something where we have to go and, and uh, take a walk? He's not synchronized. He's not moving it. Russ, maybe, maybe this would help. Can you tell me what the issue is you're struggling with?
it's hard to believe this is not why would that be hard to believe motherfucker you did it why is that why is it hard to believe this guy literally flew the queen by the way like that's how fucking decorated he was Russ, is there anything you want from me? Is there anything you want me to explain? Is there something missing that you're struggling with that I can shed some light on for you? Are those the underwear photos? Yeah, I don't know if I can show these. Man, I'm struggling with how upset my life is right now. This investigation will end up costing no less than $10 million. Easy. And they will say no to nothing. We know the dossier technique, dude. When you act like you have... I mean, all of these are just lying, okay? That's what these techniques are. Which is lying about how much information you have in an effort to draw a fucking confession out of the other person who feels as though, you know, they are in fear because... The other person is lying about how, how, how guilty this person is. <laughs> Any request this major case manager makes on this case, they've already been told it's approved. Don't even bother asking. So what am I doing, Russ? I put my best foot forward here for you, but... Damn, he's doing the fucking... He's doing it again. I really have. I don't, I don't know what else to do to, to make, make you understand the impact of what's happening here. Did we talk? I want to um, minimize the impact on my wife. So do I. Oh, dude, he's done. Oh, dude, he's fucking... Oh, my God, he so literally we, gave up. We start by telling the truth. This is called the giving up technique. I've never seen... Okay, this is actually sick. This guy just broke him, dude, in 55 minutes. Um, is she close to where? Oh she my god! I've got maps of that general area. Which town is she near? Why don't we start there? Bro, this, they had nothing, dude. That's fucking cracked, dude. They had nothing, and this guy just fucking broke him. Oh my god, dude. Holy shit, Canadian military is crazy. I'm not sure if you give me a map of... Dude. Every single woman murderer that we've seen so far will go for like 11 hours unbroken to over the course of two days. Some of them literally get away with it. This dude broke it in 56 minutes. Took 55, 56 minutes to just break this guy who was literally like a serial rapist murderer, too. God damn, dude. Uh, it covers Caligar down to the highway. And over to Tweed. And south, I'll show you. Let me see what I got here. I might have something. They actually had lots of evidence on him? No, they didn't. They had tire marks and his shoe marks. That's it. Even the fucking video suggests that, like, no, this is the burden of this is on on the the interrogation. Like a lot of this was carried by this one fucking guy, Jim Smith, or whatever his name is. The inside, outside. Okay, is she close to a road? Yep. All right. Um, is it something where, is she, is she buried or is she somewhere where if you walk there, you would, you would fairly easily see her? It's here. Okay. 
Okay. I'll be right back, okay? Do you want any water or anything? Sure. Okay, I'll be right back. How long has she been there for? A little over a week. Oh, he's Was done. It really quick from the time she left? Friday night. Friday night? Yep. So where was she between Thursday night and Friday night? In Tweed. With you? Yep. How long was she alive for? Oh, Jesus. Trigger warning. Trigger warning. Uh, I'm assuming he's going to fucking get real brutal and, and explain everything that he just did. So, holy fuck. How is there like 20 more minutes of this? This is crazy. Almost 24 hours. Not quite. Russ, you're doing the right thing here. Okay. Barry, the obvious question I'm going to have for you is when they go there, and they'll be there shortly, mm -hmm. they're going to find her. Oh, yeah. What do you want to talk about? It's uh, pretty wide open now, right? Yeah. What do you want to know? Well, do you want to work forwards or backwards? Doesn't matter. Why don't we start with Jessica? Okay. How does that start for you? Um, I saw her in her house on her treadmill. Wednesday night, I guess. And I noticed she wasn't um, there Thursday. So I got into the house to look around. Then, um, and then left. Noticed she'd come home. So I went back in. the uh, back patio door while she was uh, sleeping. So I woke her up, didn't, um, didn't hit her, she only hit her once, Friday night. Well, so I raped her in, uh, in her house. Jesus fucking Christ. And then I took her to the car and took her to tweet. And um, spent the day in tweet. And then I hit her uh, as we were walking. She thought we were leaving. Dude, how is he not even like? Okay. Well, um, what did they hit on the back of the head do? Well, I was surprised that uh, her, her skull gave way. She was there and immediately unconscious. Wait, did the fucking detective say Jesus? Or did he say it? Dude, this is fucked up, dude. Uh, I strangled her. No, the subtitles suck. What did you hit her with? Flashlight. Okay. In the house or outside the house? In the house. So when that happened, was she? Did she have clothes on or was she naked? Yeah, or? She was dressed. Okay. So when we find her, is she gonna have those clothes on too? Yeah. Right. Okay. <sighs> Marie France uh, Como. There was an open window in the basement of her uh, her house when she was away. I went in there um, a couple of nights before uh, she came home. Dude, how do you live like this, dude? Around. I went back in there uh, late at night when she was at home. She was on the phone in her bedroom. She actually discovered me in the basement. 
she was trying to get her cat to come upstairs and the cat was in the basement had seen me and was fixated on me in the corner. She couldn't get the cat up so uh, she came downstairs trying to get the cat and uh, oh my god oh my god I'm not sure why she uh, came over to me I guess the cat was staring at me and she was wondering what the cat was staring at the lights were on so when she spotted me I uh, had the same flashlight I subdued her Dude, that is a nightmare, dude. That is literally fucking nightmare shit. And uh, strangled her later in the morning. Well, more suffocated her. Right. Some tape. Bro, what the fuck? Yo, he is like. That's crazy that this dude is just like gulping at his fucking Tim Hortons over here. While this guy is like, <laughs> sorry, I need to like break away from the fucking seriousness for a moment. Cause it's holy shit. It's like, it is dark as fuck. Do you believe in the death penalty? No, not even for open and shut cases like this, but like you don't let this guy out. Like you just, you gotta, you gotta take, you gotta make sure that this dude is under close watch. How did you subdue her? And when you say subdued her in the basement, what did you do? Well, I had the same flashlight. And, um, you know, was... Why spend money on them to keep them closed for 40 to 100 years? Because of the, because of the idea that, like, you might be murdering someone innocent down the line if you think that that is acceptable. And it's not acceptable to do that. So, no, you, you should absolutely maintain the position that you can fucking you should uh, absolutely maintain the position that you can rehabilitate everyone and try to do your best to do so she saw me right away so it's just uh, hit her a couple of times and around her head try and knock her out didn't but uh, he's not innocent but it doesn't matter a little bit. Eventually, uh, why is life in jail cheaper than the death penalty so many people threw that out I did not know that Legal fees? Drew struggled to subdue her. Did she recognize you? No, I had uh, stuff on my face. So then you go upstairs and you said uh, she suffocated? Well, I suffocated her. I put tape on her. Um, I put tape on her mouth. And then I put tape on her uh, nose and held it there so she couldn't breathe. He then goes on to confess the two assaults that occurred in his hometown of Orleans, disclosing every single piece of concessive detail that authorities were hoping to attain. This prompts the detective to then delve deeper into the psychological reasoning and rationale behind the suspect's motives. Why do you think these things happen? I mean, this dude has like, oh. this dude is a freak, but also like he, he had, clearly he has a lot of issues too on top yeah. of, Yeah. you know what I mean? But I don't know the answers. Like there's some yeah, psychosexual sure. shit going on here. Well, let me, let me ask you this. Did you like or dislike these women? 
Attaining a specific and detailed motive for a violent crime holds two purposes. The primary reason is to refute any potential claims of mental instability or insanity from a defense team, whether it be during a trial or a sentencing hearing. The secondary purpose is for the further detraction of the defendant's character, which can often result in a more lengthy sentence. Motherfucker said, how did he rise through the ranks? Dude, literally ask any veteran in this community or in general if there were some real sick fucks in the military in the higher ranks it's almost like a prerequisite dude who the fuck is well adjusted in the military let alone like a fucking careerist in the military literally who is being rendered i didn't know any of them I had met Maddie Thomas that one time in that in her uh, airplane. Okay. No, I guess, I guess when, yeah, when you're going through these things, um, are you? Well, well let me, let's talk about Jessica because it's almost like the more decorated they are, the fucking crazier they are for the most part. The whole day, right? Mm -hmm. What kind of feelings were you experiencing while you were with her that day? Oh, she was a very nice girl. Do you know why you killed her? What well, I fuck? think I killed her because I knew that uh, her story would be recognized. Well, let, let me ask you this. Is it uh, two lived, right, and two died? What's, what was the difference in your mind between... You know, she was serving military, right? Mm-hmm. Would have been, uh, it would have been difficult for investigators to ignore that connection. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. So you go in, she's sleeping, and what do you do? Dude, I'm not going to lie, I would feel incredibly uncomfortable with this dude standing while I'm sitting down, which he seems kind of uncomfortable with as well. I'd be like, nah, dude, sit down. Like, how is he not in handcuffs right now? I guess because he's cooperating, but like, I would be like, ah, uh, yeah, I'm going to fucking, I'm going to go and uh, bring an AR-15 in here and point it directly at you for no reason other than the fact that I feel a, a sense of danger. I feel like I am under threat. Well, I, I snuck up to the side of her bed. She woke up. But she did as I said. So I didn't hit her. What did you say? I said, lie down on your tummy. Okay. She did. I tied her up. Which tie her up? Front. You tie her hands behind her back, and then, then what happens? I took her clothes off. Okay. And then what happened? Many more men would do this if not for the repercussions is a fucking insane take, dude. I, I, I'm sorry. You think many more men would be fucking murderer, uh, like serial rapist murderers? Like, what are you talking about, dude? That's crazy if you, if that's your worldview. Holy shit. Like, Jesus Christ, dude. Jesus fucking Christ. This is like the most edge of the edge case as far as like, as far as criminals go. My bad, I didn't realize the laws were the only thing keeping me from raping every girl I see. Yeah, like. <clears throat> it's also an ironically draconian view of uh, the world. It's like a very American approach. So I would go so far as to say it's reactionary.
because like this notion that like uh the the way that it, it's this idea that like uh the world uh runs in a certain way it's this idea that like uh like laws are the only thing preventing people from and the repercussions are the only thing preventing people from like acting out in these incredibly violent ways It's also not a good way to view the world. I would suggest seeking help in that case, if that's like unironically how you see it. I'm not trying to make fun of you at all. I'm serious. Hi, Raker. A rape can mean a lot of different things. What kind of sexual act took place? Vaginal and oral. Okay. Oral. Who was performing the oral sex? Um, no, me on her and her on me. Okay. Any, uh, any condoms used or anything like that? No. No? So there's, again, correct me if I'm wrong. Vaginal intercourse. Uh, her play, performing oral sex on you, and you performing oral sex on her. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what order those things occurred in? Yeah. I uh, started with the oral sex. Then I raped her. And then later on, I made her perform oral sex on me. Chad, he has to ask. What the fuck? It's his job. He's getting a fucking... He's not only getting a confession, but he's also, like, getting the details, man. Like, that's literally evidence that he's collecting right now. He's doing a good job. Why are you getting mad at the detective? Anything, any kind of conversation happening when this is going on? He's, like, establishing fucking motive and shit. Yeah, a little bit. What was being said? I threatened her before she, uh, before I had her perform oral sex. What did you say? Well, I put a zip tie around her neck. I said uh, that I would pull it if I didn't like what uh, she would do. Okay. Also, this motherfucker is literally working... No, motherfucker. This detective is literally working for those women that were murdered and raped. Just remember that. Like, he is actually currently working for those women who were raped and murdered. Working in their honor and, like, doing a good fucking job. So she did what you told her to do? Mm-hmm. Any issues there? Any reason to pull it? No. So, do you remember if you ejaculated at that point? Or at any point? Um, not at that point, but later on. Okay. So, the oral sex finishes, and then what happens next? Well, I continued... Um, Rape her, and I had her put on some of her underwear. Took some pictures, lots of pictures. And then uh, got her dressed, walked back to the truck. Okay. At what point did you decide that she was going to leave with you? I'm not sure. That wasn't um, necessarily always the plan. Um, do you remember the conversation about leaving? Was there any... Did she say anything about that? Or what was she saying no, to you? She was um, certainly cooperative. 
a cooperative can mean a number of different things. Was she excited about leaving with you? I, mean, I don't want to be sarcastic, but... Um, no, no, she just didn't put up too much of a fuss. Did she try and negotiate with you at all? or? I don't know. What did she say? Well, I told her that I would... Uh, Thank you, computer science major 27. Go later on. The five tier one gift subs. Okay. So when you take her out of your house, is she is she still... Did he laugh? Let her go later on. I told her that I would... Uh, let her go later on. Okay. So when you take her out of your house, is she is she still bound or? Yep. How how is that done? Just uh, hands behind her back. Okay. What about her feet? Anything there? No, she was walking freely. So where does she sit in your truck when you get to the truck? Front seat, passenger side. And where do you go? Straight to Tweed. Straight to your house in Tweed or straight yep. to just the town? Straight to the house. No stops anywhere? No. So you get home, what, 4.35 you say? Hmm. Okay. And then what happens? Uh, well, she, um, she just go to the bathroom. Shower, washer. Then we went to, into my bedroom and went to sleep a little bit. She was tied up. Do you remember how long you slept for? Not long, maybe a couple hours. Do you know if she slept? I don't know. So you wait, you get up from that, and, and what happens next? seizure <clears throat> actually she felt it coming on and um, he is married yeah he has a wife because she had some before lasted uh, not quite a while got her dressed into the family room and anyway she uh, she recovered she got uh, you know, obviously stress how do you know she had them before she told me did she tell you why she gets them well she suggested it was stress so she reco recovered from that yep she um, Stay with her and talk her through it. Wait, what is she? What What is he talking about? What What is he talking about? Like, what What does she recover from? I'm confused. How are you not paying attention? She had seizures. Okay, sorry. I didn't understand it, dude. I didn't. I missed it. My fucking bad. Better tongue. Dude, it is hard as fuck to hear him. Like, am I the only one who's having a fucking hard time to uh, hearing him, dude? I'm like trying to read the fucking subtitles. Uh, the audio is super happened? fucked. Well, let me have a little lie down right there because she was obviously exhausted. Put a cover over her and she went to sleep. Then a um, little lie my down. Daughter dressed because she thought she was leaving. Up by tea, fruit, and then as we were walking out, uh, I struck her on the back of the head. Jesus Christ! Okay, 
when did you decide to do that? In so many ways, this is super fucked because like, one, the calm and collected way that he's describing these events, but also like, the actions that he engaged in do not fucking match. Like, like I don't under... Uh, it's almost more fucked. Like, it feels as though he had no... He wasn't delirious at all. Like, it is such a deliberate manner in which he executed this shit. You know what I mean? He was very precise. He, like, lured her away, gave her a false sense of security before murdering her. Like, asked her about her situation and, like, seizures and whatnot. It is methodical, yeah. Like, th this dude... You can't fucking, yeah, I mean, this is, he is the definition of a predator, right? Like, you can't, you can't say that this dude is criminally insane. You know what I mean? Like, there's no shot. The way in which he's describing these things, despite the fact that the actions itself, like, taking uh, photos and, and, like, literally cutting underwear, taking photos with all the underwear that he stole from, like, numerous breaking and enterings uh, that he engaged in, like, all of that, signals to some sort of like psychopathic disorder right but the way in which he engages in these actions the way that he's describing the events that took place kind of ruled that out for him altogether like he knew what he was doing there was no delusion in his actions he knew what he was doing he knew that it was wrong okay and he still did it it's wild It's crazy. Well, I was uh, pretty sure that I wasn't going to let her leave. But, um, you know, the idea of striking her on the head was developed in the afternoon. Her skull gave way a little bit. Dude, the way he keeps talking about skull bashing is crazy. A lot of blood, so I think that's what happened. She was immediately unconscious. And then I um, strangled her. How'd you strangle her? Uh, same rope. Just put her on her neck. Okay. And how did you know she was dead? Well, her body stopped moving. Well, what did you do after that? I, uh, I bound her up, put her in the garage, and then I went into the base. Why'd you go to the base? Pardon me? Why'd you go to the base? Because I was flying early the next morning. Okay. So you get back to Tweed, and what happens next? I uh, took Jessica's body to that spot. And, um, how did you leave her? I just left her tucked behind a, um, a fairly large rock. Okay. Is that duct tape still on her? Mm -hmm. Um, and what else is on her? A couple of towels wrapped around her head. And, uh, the top and pants she was wearing, jeans. Okay. So you go in, and you're in the basement, and... No, that other video that we watched in, like, what is the telltale sign of a psychopath? Uh, like, what, someone who is, like, actually a psychopath versus someone who's not? The main difference there is that this dude knows what he did was wrong. The main difference in that one was that that dude did not know what he did was wrong. Does that make sense? Like... He was delirious, or you could tell that that other dude, uh, w like that other dude was not completely aware of what he was doing was like, like he didn't feel guilt. This guy, this guy, I think feels uh, the guilt. Like he understands the action. Like he understands what he did was like wrong and bad. Does that make sense?
Psychopaths can know right from wrong. That's true as well, but. No, the other dude said he knew it was wrong. He just didn't care. Yeah, this guy seems like this guy seems to have a sh sense of shame. I don't know if it's because of a sense of shame because he got caught or if it's because of a sense of shame because he knew his actions were wrong and bad. That guy also literally wanted the death penalty for himself. You can tell this guy's in a psycho place because he said, I raped her, which implies he knows is unconsensual. From what I understand, I read a little bit about it while the case was going on. And from what I understand, he, he wanted to admit partially because he wanted to what like preserve the uh the the image of the military and his wife or something and like that's kind of not like uh it's not something that a psychopath would do or maybe they would i don't fucking know but i mean it, it seems like he wants to he's like constantly worried about his wife over and over again like talking about his wife numerous times throughout the uh throughout the confession even Whereas I feel like, um, I feel like one of the traits of psychopathic behavior or a psychopath is like extreme narcissism, putting self-preservation and your own image, your sense of self above all else, even your own personal desires, no matter how violent they are, your personal satisfaction, no matter how violent it is over literally like the, the importance and sanctity of life of another human being, you know what I mean? Um, I, I don't know. It's, it's really fucked up shit, dude. But what's not fucked up is the ad time that we're going to be doing right now. So, uh, it's top of the hour boys. Uh, and, uh, it's time for a 60 second ad break. Now, if you'd like to no longer see those ads, you can subscribe. You can use an ad block. You can use VPN. Just don't say that you're from Canada on the VPN because Canada still sees the ads, you know? Or you can subscribe for $5 or you can subscribe for free with a Twitch Prime. It's up to you, of course. But like I said, a Twitch Prime subscription is free 99 if you already have an Amazon Prime. Here's the ad now. I would love to tell people to use a VPN. Uh, I don't think so, but. And uh, whereabouts in the basement are you? Um, by the furnace. Okay. Don't worry about what it. What are you doing? Like, what, uh, what's your, what's your sort right, of plan time. at that point? I was waiting for a little bit. Okay. And how long did that take? Well, she didn't. Because then she came down looking for the cat. And what is she wearing at that point? She wasn't wearing anything to start with. So when she came down to the basement, she had no clothes on? Mm -hmm. She had some sort of a shawl over her shoulder. Okay. And she immediately dropped when she saw me. Did she say anything when she saw you? She did. She called out, you bastard. Okay. And then what happened? Then I subdued her as I described. By hitting her with that red flashlight? Mm -hmm. How did you tie her at that point? Like, I know you used the rope, but what, were you, what did you tie her up, up like? Just pulled her, put her, I pulled her hands behind her back and just and tied her wrists together. Okay. And then, then what happened after that? Then I took her upstairs. Did she go upstairs under her own power, or did you carry her? No, she passed out to, um, on the stairs, and then I carried her up. Why do you think she passed out? I expect uh, from the 
hits to her head. So you carry it up to where? To her bedroom, put her on the bed. Okay. And then what happened? Uh, well, as I described, I think I uh, she's on the bed. I raped her over a period of time. Okay, and again, just to be specific, what, what sex acts took place? Just vaginal. Your penis and her vagina? Yeah. Any condom use? No. Jesus Christ, Did you ejaculate? Dude. Did you ejaculate at any point with her? No. Okay. And then what happens next? Well, as I described, I suffocated her using um, duct tape. So while you're with Marie Franz, what kind of conversations are taking place? She, anything in it, she said to you stick out in your mind? No, but I taped her mouth. Okay. When did you tape her mouth? As soon as I got her up to the bedroom. Okay. Why did you decide to do that? Because she was, uh, you know, quite aggressive. In what I was, way? I was confident she was uh, would have screamed, given the chance. Do you remember how you left her residence? Back door. I guess uh, I just have a, a couple of questions for you. I mean, I'm sure there's going to be more questions, but... Bro, how the fuck do you not get... Like, like, what does that do to a normal human's mental health? After spending two hours and 33 minutes with a dude who's like... <coughs> um, recounting the, the brutal, like, insane, inhumane acts that he engaged in, like piece by piece and you have to like literally parse through every single detail it's wild like how do you fucking stay normal after that dude that shit's crazy i guess what's on my mind right now uh, russ is um what made you decide oh to we're watching this as a youtube video knowing what happened in the aftermath it's like there's a level of reality that there's like one layer of reality that it that we're removed from and it's still fucking uh gross and hard to watch Meanwhile, this dude is just like, this dude is just straight up like, he's going through it. To tell me this tonight. Mostly uh, to make my wife's life easier. Okay. How do you feel about what you've done? Like what, uh... I think that is like almost like a personal question at that point. Disappointed. Okay. Let me ask you this. If, um, this didn't come to the point it's at right now. If for whatever reason you didn't end up on our on our radar, so to speak, uh, do you think it would have happened again? Notice the way he's asking that question. The way he's asking that question is like removing his self, uh, removing him from from like he's not asking it directly. Like, would you kill again? If you weren't caught, do you think an incident like this would happen again if we wouldn't arrive at that point? I don't know if it's a technique or not, but I feel like he's 100% asking that in the best way he possibly can to potentially get him to uh, to respond in a in a way that like is honest, I guess. I was hoping not. But I can't answer the question. The detail. Okay, that's. 
Bro, he's literally like he would do it again. That's crazy. Those that were out already didn't prepare anyone for what was heard in court today. As Colonel Russell Williams pleaded guilty to two murders, two sexual assaults, and more than 80 break-ins. And many were described in detail. Along with each count came graphic photo evidence and a clear pattern to Williams' escalating crimes. You should be aware some of the facts are highly disturbing. Peter, the evidence presented in court today painted a chilling portrait of a predator who escalated from break and enters to sexual assault to murder, giving the public its first real glimpse of Russell Williams' criminal mind. It's the most graphic insight into Williams' double life, and it started soon after Williams shuffled into the courtroom, shackled and pale. In a voice that was at times barely audible, Williams pled guilty to all 88 charges against him. Then, slumped in his chair, his eyes downcast, he listened expressionless, while the Crown exhaustively recounted the case against him. Until now, it's been reported Williams would steal women's undergarments and clothing when he broke into dozens of homes in... Including children's, by the way. He, st he, he stole, like, children's underwear, too. Tweed and Ottawa. But what emerged in court was even more disturbing that Williams often targeted the homes and the belongings of young girls. The first such incident occurred near his home in Tweed, starting a pattern that would be repeated over and over again. Today, the court released 27 photos taken by Williams himself, all of them in his own home. Of the thousands, he like cataloged it, dude. Thousands of pictures he took of lingerie stolen from drawers, closets, even laundry baskets. William laid them all. By the way, there's no shot his wife didn't know. I'm just saying. I'm sorry. There's absolutely zero, zero chance that his wife did not know, dude. I'm gonna point that out. There's no fucking shot. All out meticulously. And he tried them on. There were several similar photos released, but the CBC chose to crop them. In court, there were many more graphic pictures shown of Williams masturbating while wearing stolen garments. Police say Williams often spent hours in a given home, especially in the bedrooms of young girls he had stalked. It's very disturbing. It's very troubling. Um... My, I, my hat's off to the investigators that worked full-time on this for months and months and months to sift through this information. And there was a lot of information to sift through. Williams kept meticulous logs of every single crime he committed and buried those logs and photographs deep into his home computer's hard drive. And the Crown argued his obsession with photographs and videos continued when he took photos of the sexual assaults of Marie-France Como and Jessica Lloyd and video of Como's murder. That evidence has yet to be released. Lloyd's family is bracing for a devastating week. He pled guilty. Uh, we know what the sentence is going to be. Why is the court going through all this? Why are we hearing the things we're hearing, seeing the things we're seeing in such detail? It is, it would seem on the surface to be an open and shut case, Peter, but lawyers and the Crown especially, and police too, wanted to lay out to the public the scope and the extent of their investigation, the sheer number of crimes, the horrific nature of the crimes, and especially to satiate the public's interest in such a public figure. He was a killer with the ultimate cover. As a base commander in the Canadian Air Force, Colonel Russell Williams comforted families of the fallen, rubbed shoulders with the Prime Minister, and even flew planes for the Queen. But no one, including his wife, knew that he was also a sexual deviant, Doubt it. burglar, rapist, and murderer. And today, what began as fetish and fantasy led to a life sentence of solitary misery. Jim Smith was later praised for his impassive and methodical approach to the interrogation as he used one rational argument after another to slowly... Who took the photos? I mean, his wife could have taken the photos, but also tripods do exist. Like, it is a technology that exists. You know, convinced you, you, you can take timed photos of yourself. ...suspect that his only option was to confess, void of any antagonistic strategies whatsoever. It was perfectly executed, and Smith became somewhat of a cult figure in the realm of criminology and police culture. He has been offered a multitude... A crack, dude. 55 minutes it took for him to fucking break this dude down of highly lucrative deals from a variety of international publishing companies to write a book on his background and expertise, all of which he has refused and continues to work as a senior criminal investigator to the present day.